Raised on strong principles forged in combat and a daring voice on the world stage, today I'm sitting down with Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, to talk about his journey to public service, what keeps him motivated to continue fighting for freedom and safety, and what he sees for Israel's future. If you're enjoying Table Talk, be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Remember to click that notification bell to stay up to date on all of our latest posts. So what does it take to forge one of the world's most prolific and daring leaders? Today you'll hear some of the incredible life story of a man who had been at the forefront of shaping safety and security in Israel and the Middle East. Take a look. As Israel's longest serving prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu has solidified himself as a strong global leader. Having now been elected six terms to office, he has spent his career championing the cause of Israel and defending its existence. But what helps shape this dynamic statesman? Family has played a major role, having been raised by his father, a renowned historian, and his mother, a strong Zionist. And the example his brother Yoni set through bravery and service of his country has no doubt fueled his own trajectory. Having served his country in such capacities as commander in one of Israel's elite special forces unit, as a news contributor on topics of Israel and the Middle East, and as the country's ambassador to the UN, but at the heart of it all is a passion to see his nation continue to thrive and exist, no matter what the future brings. Benjamin Netanyahu, a legacy of strength. Hello, Mr. Prime Minister. My name is Joni Lamb. I'm coming to you from the studios of the Daystar Television Network here in Dallas, Texas. Welcome. It's our honor to have you today. Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you. Well, he has been a visionary leader in the nation of Israel, an advocate for Christian support of the Jewish people, a stout critic of the land for peace notion championed by some world leaders, and he just won his sixth term in office. Please welcome Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, what an honor to have you today. I know you must be very busy. Thank you for taking out the time to talk to the Daystar te television audience, Mr. Prime Minister. Well, thank you. Actually, it's my the longest serving prime minister of Israel, and I'm beginning, as I say, my sixth term with the same mission. That is to assure the uh, security, prosperity, and permanence of the one and only Jewish state. Uh, and I welcome, as you said in your introductory remarks, the tremendous support of uh, uh, Christian Zionists, Christian believers, evangelical Christians uh, in the United States, and frankly, around the world. And it's, uh, it warms our heart, and it's a tremendous encouragement. Um, Daystar is blessed to be on every uh, platform in Israel, on Hot, Yes, Cellcom. And so um, we not only support Israel in word, but in deed. And we do pray for you, Mr. Prime Minister. As I was looking through your book and reading through your book, it is evident to me that God's hand has been on your life from the very beginning. I'm sure you could have never imagined as a young boy that God would call you to do what you are doing now. Take us back to the beginning and tell us a little bit about uh, your family in your early days. Well, my father was a great historian of the Jewish people. My gra grandfather before him was a rabbi. Uh, they both worked for the establishment of the Jewish state uh, before and after the Holocaust. Uh, and I was born a year after the founding of the state in, uh, and uh, spent my childhood years first in Jerusalem and then a few years in the United States with uh, my parents and my two uh, brothers, my older brother, Jonathan, uh, and my younger brother, Ido. We joined the military. We served in the same elite unit, uh, which is a kind of a cross between uh, the Navy SEALs, Delta Force. It's a tiny unit that, uh, uh, during which, um, in, in the service of which, I was wounded while rescuing hostages from a hijacked uh, Belgian airliner that landed in Tel Aviv. And four years later, my brother fell while leading perhaps the most spectacular rescue mission in modern times, the raid on Antebbe, in which uh, his unit, led by him, uh, saved 103 Israeli hostages uh, from the heart of Africa. It seemed like an impossible mission, but he did it. 
And again, he was the only military casualty. Um, that uh, event changed my life and steered it to its present course. I uh, basically devoted my time to trying to recruit the free world to a more active and uh, and aggressive position against international terrorism. That led me into diplomacy and eventually into politics. So uh, very much the influence of my grandfather, my father, and my fallen brother uh, shaped me into this life of, uh, of service. And even though I had suffered inconsolable grief at the fall of my, uh, my older brother, who was a great hero, a hero of Israel, a hero, of, uh, I think, of mankind, uh, I found uh, his sacrifice an example, uh, a tremendous uh, uh, encouragement for a life of purpose. And if I had to say something that your readers would glean from reading uh, my story it, is that it's not merely my story, it's our story. The story of the rebirth of the Jewish state, the story of the state of Israel, the story of the bond that we have with so many around the world, and also the uh, the story of a life of purpose. And I think if there's one thing that I would tell your viewers is that when you have a purpose bigger than yourself, your life will be greatly enriched. And you can find this in, in this book. I agree with you. And um, in reading about your great grandfather, Abraham Marcus, he was uh, a godly man that really reached out to all. You talk a little bit about that in your book. Uh, my great grandfather on my mother's side uh, may have been the only person in the 19th century who emigrated uh, not to America, but from America to uh, the land of Israel. He uh, he actually came to the United States in the in the 19th century, uh, in the 1870s. Uh, traded furs with the Native Americans, amassed enough uh, money, and decided to realize his dream to go to the land of Zion, and and he did, and he came to uh, <laughs> he came to uh, one of the early communities there, uh, which is called actually the First of Zion, um, and he. Uh, he, his family, his daughter, my grandmother, later decided to join her father, uh, and that's how my mother was born in uh, in 1912 in uh, in another community. Uh, so my family steeped on both sides with lovers of Zion uh, and people who devoted their lives and their hopes and their dreams and educated their children and their grandchildren uh, for the love of Zion, the love of Jerusalem. I know that uh, you talk about your brother in the book. It's it's apparent that you had a great love and admiration for him. And of course, many of us here in America watched the movie on NTV that was uh, that was done. And uh, of course, your brother was a part of that raid that actually was a success. Um, how hard was it for you to recount this story in the book as you wrote the book? Well, as you may have noticed, it's uh, it's perhaps the most poignant and dramatic uh, moment in a in a book that's full a life that's full of poignant and dramatic uh, movements uh, uh, events. I described my experience as a soldier in this elite combat unit. The I nearly drowned in the Suez Canal in a firefight. Uh, I was shot at while rescuing uh, uh, a plane full of hostages in in Israel. I was nearly drove into a phantom jet as it was taking off, just like you see in the movies, you know, a Jeep literally almost being crushed by this uh, um, this uh, uh, fighter aircraft and so many other things. And yet none of this, um, these skirmishes with death, and there were many, uh, really were even remotely parallel to the, uh, the horrible moment that, I learned on the uh, bicentennial of the United States. I was studying it uh, in Boston at MIT at the time, uh, having uh, completed my military service. Uh, I was uh, um, joining other Israelis celebrating the the 200th uh, birthday of the United States, the birth of liberty, modern liberty. And uh, I heard that uh, uh, that an Israeli force had liberated hostages from um, Entebbe, Uganda, and that that force was making its way back to Israel. Uh, and then they said something that and we were all 
joyous, obviously. But then they said something. They said one officer was killed. And I, I didn't understand. Why did they say officer? They would say one Israeli soldier, and yet they said officer. So I, I knew uh, right away that uh, it was my brother and our special unit that had carried this off because nobody else would um, could uh, do something like this. So I went to my bookshelf and took out an atlas and figured the distance to uh, from Israel to uh, uh, to Entebbe, thousands of miles. I figured, well, that would take between three to five Hercules transport planes, say um, 150 to 200 men. A quarter would be officers because they'd fight their way into such a force, such a mission. So what were the odds? Well, one to 50 uh, in the unit uh, in which we served, we faced even worse odds. It's not that bad. And yet I, I couldn't relax. I called my younger brother and I said, is Yoni back? Yoni is Jonathan, Johnny, my uh, older brother. And he said, no, not yet. And then I called him a few hours later and I said, well, did you hear anything? He said, no, but I sense that something is wrong. Then a few hours later, uh, the phone rang, and I said to my wife, uh, that's Ido, my younger brother. Uh, that's Ido calling to tell me that Yoni had been killed. And it was. And this was a moment of just unspeakable agony on both sides of the line. And the only thing I could think of at that point was that I had to get to my parents before the news reached them. My father was teaching in uh, Cornell University in upstate New York, in Ithaca, New York. So I drove for seven hours in this uh, Via Dolorosa. I mean, it's impossible to describe the uh, the anguish. Uh, walked up to my father's, um, uh, my parents' home there. Uh, it, it had a big front window. And my, so I could see through the, the window as I was walking down the path. Uh, I could see my father sort of stepping back and forth with his hands clasped uh, behind his back when he was deep in thought. And all of a sudden he turned his head and he saw me and he said, Bibi, what are you doing here? And then immediately he saw my face and he let out this horrible scream uh, like a wounded animal. And then I heard my mother scream and this was actually worse than hearing about my brother's death. It was uh, the most difficult moment in my life, and I uh, describe it um, uh, as such in my book as well. But I drew enormous uh, encouragement from the dignity and courage of my parents who bore their grief with uh, just astonishing dignity. And uh, somehow I found the strength from their strength, and perhaps they from mine. And we overcame it and um, and proceeded to uh, to continue Yoni's legacy in fighting terrorism, not only militarily, but on a global scale. I, I indeed am sorry uh, for your loss, and you described that so beautifully. I'm sure many watching today have had similar experiences where maybe they've lost a loved one, but what I take from that is you took that loss and uh, garnered strength from it and the fact that you're doing what you're doing today is a testament to that. Uh, you may be interested to know I was in a meeting uh, a few years back uh, with a group of evangelicals who were talking about how to achieve peace and with the Palestinians. And um, as they were talking about possibly dividing the land, you have to understand that our audience understands that the land of Israel was a covenant uh, that God made with Abraham. We understand that very, very clearly that it's not to be divided. We stand with you on that. And uh, I remember Michelle Bachman was in the, in the meeting and she spoke up and said, you cannot divide Israel. You know, the thing about you, Mr. Prime Minister, one of your many strengths is that you do understand America and the world because you've lived here, you've lived in Israel, and um, you're such a, a an amazing communicator and a strong leader, help our audience understand that dynamic because we hear a narrative from the secular media here in America that is much different from the truth. So help our audience to understand why you can't divide up the land in Israel. 
First of all, it's our ancestral homeland. It's the land of uh, Israel that uh, we've been attached to for 3,500 years, from the time of Abraham. 3,000 years ago, uh, King David established Jerusalem as our capital. 3,000 years ago, you know? Think of how long Washington has been the capital of the United States. Uh, uh, 200, two centuries, uh, really, uh, a little more, uh, and so on, uh, 3,000 years ago. And yet, uh, only recently did uh, the American president, President Trump, finally do justice to history by declaring a simple thing, that Jerusalem is the capital uh, of Israel. Now, you're not going to divide Washington uh, either, right? Uh, and the Brits are not going to divide London, and the French aren't going to divide Paris. Well, we sure uh, are not going to divide uh, Jerusalem, and we don't want to uh, and shouldn't uh, divide up our ancestral homeland either. So uh, the argument that people say is, well, if you don't do that, you're not going to get peace with the Arab world, because if you don't give the Palestinians uh, um, the, the hills above Tel Aviv and around Jerusalem and in Jerusalem, you're not going to have peace. The logical flaw in there is not only our claim to our land and to our capital, it's a logical flaw because the Palestinians don't want peace with Israel. They want peace without Israel. They don't want a state next to Israel. They want a state instead of Israel. So if you wait for them to give their go-ahead to making peace with the rest of the Arab world, and mind you, the Palestinians are 1% to 2% of the Arab world. It's the, the tail wagging the body, the Arab body. Uh, if you wait for them, well, we waited a quarter of a century, and we didn't have peace after our initial peace treaties with Egypt and Jordan. For a quarter of a century, we had no peace treaty because the Palestinians who want to see the disappearance of Israel are vetoing any peace uh, on that. So I went around that, and I went to the Arab states, uh, and with the help of uh, the American administration, the Trump administration, we achieved four historic peace treaties with uh, Morocco, with uh, the United Arab Emirates, with Bahrain, and with uh, the Sudan. Uh, and more will come. I'm sure that one of my tasks in the coming uh, administration is to uh, expand the circle of peace to uh, beyond anything that we can imagine and basically finish the Arab-Israeli conflict and be left with the Palestinians uh, in the hope that they uh, uh, finally uh, understand that they have to recognize the Jewish state, which is why we don't have peace, because they don't recognize the Jewish state. Uh, if that is not understood, uh, in the um, uh, you know in the intellectual circles or the diplomatic circles in the United States, well, actually, I think they're beginning to understand it because of the Abraham Accords, because of the historical breakthroughs with the Arab world. They could see that uh, that we can make peace with uh, just about everyone in the Arab world. Uh, we can make peace with those who want peace. You can't make peace with those who don't want it. And that distinction took a while for me to to draw and convince people. But uh, I intend to uh, expand the circle of peace even more. Don't wait for the Palestinians. They'll be the last to come. So here you are, um, re-elected into this position. And it, I know it hasn't been an easy journey for you, but you are known as a strong leader. There's a lot of chaos going on in and around Israel right now, in and around the world. Do you think that's why the Israeli people have put you back in this position? Yeah, although I'm very grateful to the fact that they gave me a, a reprieve for a year because I could write this book. <laughs> you know, I should never write it in office. I, I, I wrote it in longhand. So, but having said that, yeah, I think the, the Israel needs, and the Israeli public clearly wants strong leadership. And mind you, Israel is um, um, uh, uh, an island of success uh, and prosperity and security in uh, uh, the otherwise unstable Middle East. But the, the instability in the Middle East is principally a problem of Iran, the the growing threats from Iran, its quest for nuclear weapons, the uh, terrorist forces and proxies that it sponsors throughout the Middle East. And I've made it my life's mission to prevent Iran from achieving, uh, from getting a nuclear arsenal uh, and fighting its terrorism um, uh, every day. And we're successful in that. But I, I would also say that Israel itself is successful, and I urge all of you are uh, audience to come to Israel and see, first of all, you'll see a, an amazing combination of the old and the new, because when you visit Israel, you uh, you can follow the footsteps of Jesus from the Galilee to, uh, uh, to uh, Jerusalem, to Bethlehem. It's all there. I mean, these are real places. They're not uh, up in the sky. They're, they're there in 
uh, and quite amazing to see. And at the same time, you're seeing not only how we respect our past, but how we seize the future with uh, uh, extraordinary innovation that has made Israel, uh, once we liberated its economy, it was something else I describe in my book, how I turned a semi-socialist state into a, a vibrant free market economy. Well, the combination of, of ingenuity and free markets made Israel uh, a very, very successful uh, country. Uh, and we went from $17,000 per capita income when I took over to uh, 53,000. So we passed Britain in GDP per capita, we passed France, we passed Japan, and we passed Germany. Uh, and uh, listen, uh, we're still behind the United States, but um, give me uh, the next four years, we might catch up. So you should come to this extraordinary land, the old and the new, uh, and you'll be welcomed in a, in a way that uh, um, that ex reflects the fact that Israelis understand how valuable, how important the support of uh, of Christians around the world is. We have we have no better friends, and I know that. Everybody knows that. Well, you may be surprised to know that it was in 1983 that my husband and I were in Israel. Uh, just a young married couple, and it was on the Mount of Olives that God spoke to him about getting involved in television. We had no idea at that at that time that it would grow to be the largest Christian television network in the world. Um, so we do have that connection to Israel, and we are bringing a tour to Israel in 2023. So Israel is open again, and you do encourage people to come back to the land of the Bible and uh, see exactly what you're talking about. It is a marvelous place, a beautiful place. And there's something very special as you drive into the city of Jerusalem. Indeed, it is indeed, you know, and I never forget it. I, I describe my uh, military service. So, you know, in this unit, uh, we, we put a, a, a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, navigation, uh, primarily night navigation. You know, just walking without, we didn't have all these uh, computer simulations. We didn't have GPS. So we had to memorize the route by heart, which I did. But this was preceded by months of daytime navigation. And in these daytime navigations, this is right after the Six Day War when I uh, was uh, volunteered for the Special Forces. Uh, and I went through Judea and I went through Samaria. I went into Galilee. I went into Negev. Um, and it was... Uh, all the places that I saw, including in the Sinai, that I read in the Bible. And I would walk from one place to the other. And even though we were, you know, this was, these are grueling marches. I mean, they're really, they're really hard. But I would stop, uh, even though it was short stops, in places uh, that are mentioned in the Bible. And I would wonder at the fact that this extraordinary birth of the Jewish people, we had come back just as the just as the prophets had prophesied, uh, the ingathering of the exiles, the rebirth of Israel, uh, the rebirth of, uh, of a united Jerusalem, this never failed to uh, inspire me. And it inspires me just the same today, Joni. This is, this is our purpose. This is our mission. And we achieved the first part, is to reconstitute our national life in, in the land of Zion. And the second mission is to uh, ensure its future. Once reconstituted, once the uh, the Jewish people uh, re forded this river uh, between annihilation and salvation, now we have to ensure that this dream uh, is permanent. And I've made it my life's mission to make Israel very, very strong. Strong economically, strong militarily, strong diplomatically, and that strength produced the peace treaties with the Arab countries because they view now Israel not as their uh, enemy, but as their ally. I would say their indispensable ally in uh, rolling back Iran's aggression. So this has led to peace, strength, peace through strength. It's an expression that your audience, I'm sure, knows. It's true. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's interested in, in a weak Israel, and a weak Israel will not survive and will not make alliances. But once you're strong, people come to that strength. And that strength is not merely an external th strength, but it's the fortitude of spirit and of faith that animates me and so many of our people.
Well, I want to encourage those of you watching to get um, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's book, BB, My Story. It's a fascinating read. It really goes, he goes into great detail, answers a lot of questions that you may have about Israel. Last question, Mr. Prime Minister, what was it like walking to the Wailing Wall after that six-day war? It's impossible to describe because, you know, I lived in Jerusalem and it was a divided city for the first 19 years of Israel's uh, life uh, because half of it was conquered by the uh, Jordanian Legion and uh, Jews who had lived in the Jewish quarter for centuries were kicked out. Um, and then in a miraculous six-day war, uh, the Israeli army, which was surrounded by three Arab armies, uh, managed to roll back these forces uh, and liberate our ancient capital. Uh, and I remember that uh, I went out of the bunker, which uh, <laughs> I'd been through in the, the, the those six days because we were being shelled at by Arab artillery. And all of a sudden it stopped because we won the war. And I went out into the sunshine and I, I remember thinking this is a victory of biblical proportions. And I just walked with the rest of the multitudes uh, of Israelis who walked, streamed right through the, uh, through the barricades, really. Uh, the old barricades of the, uh, the pre-war barricades went into the Western Wall and stood there before the rampart of the, of the second temple, the second Jewish temple, right, holding right next to the Temple Mount. And it was a feeling of elation that is indescribable. It's as if all of our history, all of our, all of Jewish history and all of uh, our common civilization uh, was on those walls. And when you touch that wall, when you touch those stones, I felt that I was, um, I was touching eternity. Well, I want to thank you, Prime Minister, for joining us here at Daystar. I know how incredibly busy you are. Thank you for taking the time to share with our audience. Again, I want to uh, encourage our audience to get his book, BB, My Story. I hope everybody will read it. You're going to love it. And uh, we will be praying for you. And Daystar stands with you. And we stand with Israel, again, not just in word, but in deed. God bless you, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you, Joni, and God bless you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we are out of time. I want to thank Prime Minister Netanyahu for allowing us to share his story with all of you. Remember to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and Israel. At Daystar, we firmly believe in God's covenant with the Jewish people and his promise to bless those that bless them and curse those that curse them. So continue to stand with Israel. And if you want an exciting read that will also give you great insight to the modern history of that nation as well as its prime minister, then you'll definitely want to pick up a copy of Prime Minister Netanyahu's book, BB, My Story. You can find it wherever books are sold. Well, if you've enjoyed today's program, let us know by leaving us a comment on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube. I want to thank you for watching. Thank you again, Prime Minister, for joining us. Until next time, bye-bye for today.